Now, a, a couple more uh, model. Well, actually, the first one, I suppose, is is a whole class of models. That's the capability maturity model or models because there are a number of capability maturity models. Uh, there are capability maturity models for uh, security. There are capability maturity models for business. There are capability maturity models for specific areas of security. Uh, and uh, we just... We have a lot of capability maturity models, but uh, fortunately, uh, they are all very, very similar. Um, uh, they are uh, steps, a series of steps, and uh, the, the point is to try and improve and, and climb the steps. Um, uh, there, uh, some models have different numbers of steps, um, but an awful lot of them uh, stick to the uh, the basic um, uh, I believe the uh, the first uh, capability maturity model um, which has basically five steps and they they start out at uh, the base step um, again there are sometimes different um, names for them but uh, originally the the first step was known as chaotic which is basically, we don't know what we're doing. Um, and, uh, I mean, after all, that's, that's where an awful lot of us start. Uh, I am in a uh, situation right now with uh, an organization that I'm trying to help. And yeah, they, they are uh, in this chaotic state that they have problems at the strategic level, at the tactical level, at... Uh, the operational level and the fact that they do not have formal policies in many areas um, uh, makes the tactical and operational uh, difficulties that they have that much worse and, and intractable of a uh, solution or if you put a solution in place very often it, it creates other problems so yeah you, you understand chaos um, You've probably all been in situations like that. Um, anyways, that's, uh, so the, the second uh, step um, is often simply known as repeatable, which in a sense is, is saying, we still don't know what we're doing, but at least we can do it again. Uh, we, we start to uh, follow uh, some regularity of of operations um, but uh, uh, it, it's interesting to note that that is separate from the third step which is documented which is when we start to write down what it is that we are doing um, with our operations and uh, uh, hopefully um, at this point we also start to write down uh, some of the uh, you know, policy and architectural uh, descriptions as well, because that assists us in getting to the fourth step, which uh, is usually referred to as managed. And um, that is where we want to go. Uh, we want to have, you know, document our policy, follow it, use it to guide what we do in terms of our tactical uh, uh, pursuits uh, and management and our operations on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, now, there is one uh, final level. The uh, uh, level five tends to be known as either optimizing or constantly optimizing. And unfortunately, that is not as well defined. That's um, very vaguely, we're going to make things better. But, you know, how are we going to make things better? How do we determine what's better? Um, and that is, is left unsaid. And of course, um, what is the difference between chaos and constant optimization? Um, unless we have some uh, additional guidance. And that, that tends to be missing from the capability maturity models, unfortunately. Um, but, fortunately, 
um, the the point of the capability maturity models really I mean you know yes you want to you want to climb the ladder uh, or the stairs but the uh, the point is you cannot jump from one step to another you you cannot skip steps we cannot go from chaos to constant optimization unless of course you consider them the same thing um, we we have to you know get to the point where we can repeat what we're doing we have to uh, get to the point where we document what we're doing we have to get to the point where we manage what we're doing it it is a stepwise process and and do not frustrate yourself by trying to take too many steps at once that's basically uh, the lesson of the capability maturity models now I want to throw in one more uh, formal model here and that is the Brewer Nash model otherwise known as the uh, the Chinese wall model uh, probably because somebody uh, decided that uh, a wall with no door but a, a pass-through that restricts what can be uh, exchanged between one side of the wall and the other um, is a Chinese wall. Uh, and, and probably the, uh, the pass-through here is, is uh, think about one of these situations where you've got a, a drum inset into the wall and so you can, you, it's not even a, a straight window, it is in fact something where you have to, it's, it's kind of a man trap situation where um, if it's open on one side, it's closed on the other. Uh, uh, interestingly, um, this was, uh, this drum situation was used in uh, the automat restaurants in um, uh, uh, Philadelphia and New York. Um, they had a, a, a drum situation where uh, uh, the staff who were refilling the items that you could choose from the automat, um, they, they'd rotate the drum to be open on their side so that they could refill it, and that prevented people from actually interacting with uh, the system from the other side and, and taking the food uh, until uh, a specific cylinder had been uh, refilled. Uh, interesting. And the, um, uh, so the, the Brewer Nash model, the Chinese wall model, um, is in situations where we have uh, two groups with, within possibly the same company um, working in situations where there is a possible conflict of interest. And for example, if we have a, a bank handling the merger of two corporations. And um, as the negotiations for the merger go on, if one side or the other has information about the, inf the other side or, or too much information, um, that gives them an advantage and, and uh, presents the possibility of a conflict of interest. So in uh, this case, the, the bank acting as the intermediary, the, the teams uh, dealing with one company and the other company are in fact separate. And the, uh, there is this, this wall, this uh, Chinese wall, that there is a, a management and a restriction of the information that is uh, allowed to be exchanged between the two teams and ensure that the uh, that the uh, information uh, doesn't get disclosed to the detriment of either side. Uh, and of course, you know, the conflict of interest here is, is that somebody who has access to both sides of the information uh, could be bribed from one of the companies to, to pass information improperly and therefore give them an advantage uh, in that particular situation. But again, you know, having, having the restriction of information, that's the Brewer-Nash model.